face. The world used to be a bigger place. The world's still the same. It's just less in it. In Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End, Jack Sparrow must return from the dead to unite all pirates from all corners of the world against the darkest enemy the world has ever seen, the government. Oh, hell no. And if you know me, then you already know that the result is one of the greatest blockbuster adventures of all time. My own biases aside though, At World's End isn't exactly Dead Man's Chest, it's not the greatest movie ever made. There are problems here, mainly around the usual Hollywood topic of size, meaning that the movie is way too big for its own good, it holds way too much inside it. Damn. That's a big, big the Calypso idea should have been swapped out with something less force. The whole pirate coat thing should have been outright removed because it doesn't even make any sense. There are flaws, yes. Proclaim this all to be folly! But still, if you break this movie down to parts, you'll find that it is better than 95% of what else Hollywood has to offer. The music is second to none, the cinematography is astounding, the CGI is treated with way more care and effort than anywhere today. The main hero is one of the most iconic and entertaining in existence. The comedy and jokes are not just Marvel funny, but actually funny. Not to mention that the production value and set design is insane, to the point of laughing at the biggest productions of today. What the f is this piece of shit? I could go on and on, but all that being said, quite possibly the biggest strength of At World's End that puts it above even its predecessor is the character side. And I don't mean characters by themselves, but more so characters as an ensemble, their ties and connections and relationships. The level on which this movie handles that is a level that pretty much no modern blockbuster productions can reach. Not DC, not Marvel, not anyone except maybe Lord of the Rings. My hands are clean in this. I mean, definitely not Marvel, because I just saw the Marvels, and the worst weaknesses of that movie are the greatest strengths of this movie. Power dynamics between characters are exciting because they're less about simple power and more about leverage, which is constantly in flux. Relationships between characters are interesting because they're singular in nature and in conflict with the norm. And characters themselves feel alive because they're individuals instead of small parts of two big opposing teams. And so, to maintain the Filmento Christmas Pirates tradition, let's sail into the world of At World's End to explore this topic deeper. How to create a better set of ensemble characters than anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> All right then. Firstly, the reason scenes and interactions between characters here are exciting to follow is because they're not about who is more powerful than who, but more so about who in the moment has leverage over who. To introduce what I mean, look at Davy Jones, hands down the most powerful person in the movie. He basically owns the sea, any ship unfortunate enough to get in his way is as good as dead. Based on sheer power rankings, he's unbeatable, he's Thanos with the full infinity glove. But despite that, in many scenes and interactions, he still doesn't hold the power. Hello. Like when Will has come aboard Beckett's ship. Do not test. And finish that. As weird as it sounds, in this hostile interaction between Davy Jones and Will, Will is in control. But how? Davy Jones is way stronger. He could snap Will in half then and there. Well, because of leverage. Will holds leverage over Beckett by being able to bargain with something that Beckett needs, whereas Beckett holds leverage over Davy Jones by holding his weakness hostage. And just like that, the expected power dynamic in this one interaction has become something unexpected, which can be way more exciting and fresh feeling to follow compared to every interaction always depending on the obvious level of force. Oh, 
but the villain can beat up the hero with this weapon and therefore in the scene she holds the power. Oh, Thanos can beat up the Hulk with his fists and therefore in the scene he holds the power. Interactions of force can be great too, yes, but my point is that there's more you can do, that power dynamics can be about more than power. When the heroes go rescue Jack, for example, they should be in control because they're the rescuers, they have the crew, Jack's gonna have to abide by their command. Except, oh wait, here comes leverage. Right, so suddenly, because Jack has the only ship, he has the crew. That makes you the highest bidder. And because he has the crew, he has control. Except when he suddenly doesn't, because again, leverage. Which way are you going, Jack? That's basically Jack and Barbosa's interactions in the movie in a nutshell. They're constantly competing and trying to get their way over the other, but not in terms of who can beat up or shoot who, but more so who has more leverage over who. It's constantly in flux. That's what makes it so exciting and awesome. How do you understand that you lot will not be keeping to the code then? <laughs> Or if you look at Lizzie, her power level is the weakest of them all. She's not a pirate with a crew, she's not anyone. In the pirate world, she's a nobody with nothing. Particularly a woman. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine. And so when Sao Feng, the pirate lord of Singapore, takes her prisoner, he obviously holds the power there, right? No, she does. How? Because Sao Feng has been led to believe that Lizzie is Calypso, the goddess of the sea bound to human form. And when she senses this, she leverages his mistaken fear against him, eventually inheriting his position in the process. You are captain now. Of course, Sao Feng's crew does not accept Lizzie as their leader because they see her as just some useless girl. You are not my captain. But still, they ultimately have to, because... Who among you do you name as captain? Captain, sir. See, the Singaporean crew is held at the mercy of Davy Jones, and since they're scared of Davy Jones, they point to Lizzie as the one in charge to take the fall. But unlike the crew, Lizzie doesn't have to be scared, because on the ship to command Davy Jones on behalf of Beckett is Norrington. Norrington, who Lizzie has power over because he's her biggest simp. In other words, in a scene that involves a pirate lord's crew, Davy Jones and his crew, as well as a crew of the British Navy, the character holding the ultimate power to decide what happens is Lizzie. Look at me. I'm the captain now. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Not because she's more powerful than the others, but because through a long series of leverages, she comes out on top. And that's freaking masterful writing, way more fascinating than Lizzie having control because she's actually super buff and can beat everyone up. Again, scenes of force have their place, but my point is to think of power dynamics between characters in a more complex and ever-changing way. Tia Dalma could kill Barbosa instantly, yet in this interaction Barbosa still has control because Tia Dalma needs him to convince the other pirate lords to free her into her godly form. Power is at its best when it keeps changing based on what and between who the interaction is. Points to the thing you want most. Me? Dead. Think deeper. Think leverage. Although, if I kill you, then I can use the compass to find Shipwreck Cove. It cut out the middleman, as it were. Secondly, the reason relationships here are interesting to follow is because they're singular in nature and constantly transforming each other into less obvious forms. If you take Lizzie and Will, for example, their relationship should be pretty simple. They're in love, everything they do is for each other, right? Well, no, because their connection is strained by their own connections with other characters. Basically, Lizzie feels terrible for leaving Jack for the Kraken in the last movie, and so she, most of all, wants to save Jack to be able to live with herself again, which is pulling her away from Will because she's not talking about it and Will gets the wrong idea. Once we rescue Jack, everything will be fine. Oh my god, bro. And on the other side, Will has made a promise to save his dad from the Flying Dutchman at any cost, which is pulling him away from Lizzie because it doesn't seem like he can have them both. It's my button to bear. 
Oh my god, bro. Oh. In other words, a simple relationship has become way less simple and more interesting due to other relationships that affect it, which is the case with pretty much all the significant characters here. It's like a massive web of individual connections that constantly change the other connections into forms that you might not first expect. Jack and Barbosa, for example, are sworn enemies. Barbosa once led a mutiny against Jack, and the last time they met, Jack killed them. Remember, you shot me. But still, these two sworn enemies currently cannot be enemies because they're both threatened by another hostile connection that forces them to be allies. That's why this relationship is so entertaining. They're enemies forced to not be enemies. You lead the shore party, I'll stay with my ship. I'll not be leaving my ship in your command. Or as a similar case, look at Jack and Sao Feng. Clearly, Sao Feng isn't the biggest fan of Jack. He's not too excited about helping to rescue him. The only reason I would want Jack Sparrow to return from the land of the dead is so I can send him back myself! And yet, he helps to rescue him, because his other connections force him to. See, Will is asking Sao Feng's help in exchange for helping him cut a deal with Beckett, who Sao Feng is desperate to be friends with because he thinks Beckett is unstoppable now that he controls Davy Jones. So again, an enemy who in this moment cannot behave like an enemy. Theory will take you only so far. Or if you look at Norrington, his main connection is with his duty and the British crown, which is represented by Beckett. However, he also has a simp relationship with Lizzie, who happens to be on the Crown's representative's blacklist. And because that simp connection is more important to Norrington than his duty connection, that's the direction he pivots into. One changes the other. Go now. Or if you look at Jack and Beckett, same thing. They're enemies, yet currently they can't be enemies because their other connections force them to be friends. Beckett is intimidated by the mysterious A's that the pirates have, whereas Jack is still running from his debt to Davy Jones. Hostiles are allies. Okay, you help me with my pirate ace problem, and I help you with your Davy Jones problem. It's just good business. You should definitely watch the full movie and keep track of this yourself, but my point is that character relationships change based on other relationships. That's why each interaction feels fresh and unique, because current circumstances may have turned the connection between those characters into a different kind than what it was just moments ago. It's way more fascinating to watch than if it was all statically divided. Like, oh, these characters are friendly because they're friendly, and these characters are hostile because they're hostile. It just doesn't compare. It is okay to have static relationships that stay as they are, definitely. I'm just saying that there's gold to be found by looking at it also in a more complex manner. You know, Tia Dalma should be against the pirates because pirates imprisoned her, but she also has to be against the opposite side because of Davy Jones, who back in the day was on the pirate side and showed them how to imprison her. Suddenly, it becomes way less obvious and more intriguing to see how exactly these connections in this moment will play out. Thirdly, the reason characters here feel alive like real people is because they chase their own objectives as if they're all heroes of their own stories. On surface level, there are two opposing teams in this movie. The pirate side trying to achieve freedom for all, and the government side trying to snuff out piracy and harness the world with law. But once you look deeper into these teams, you'll find that they're not so much collective teams as they are collections of individuals with individual motivations. For example, when the pirates are trying to go save Jack in the first hour, each of them has their own angle for doing so. Lizzie needs to rescue Jack to be able to live with herself after she killed him. Will needs to rescue Jack because he needs the Black Pearl to free his father. And Barbosa needs to rescue Jack because he needs Jack's piece of eight to release Calypso. As in, even though this is one team going after one goal, in reality it isn't. It's individual people chasing their own goals that for now happen to align. Captain Turner needs the pearl. And you felt guilty. And you and your brother in court. Did no one come to save me just because they missed me?
This may seem obvious when done right, but still not obvious enough for most Hollywood movies to get right. When I saw the Marvels, for example, I had no idea why the two other heroes were fighting the bad guy that they had never even met. It was mostly like, well, they're tied to Captain Marvel now, and Captain Marvel is fighting this evil villain, so I guess now they're doing it too. You know, they're the good team, and the purpose of the good team is to fight the bad team. That's what happens in movies. The heroes fight the villains. Nice. And to put it bluntly, please don't do that, because characters like that will never exceed mediocrity. If you're gonna feature multiple main characters divided into teams, you must still treat each of those characters as their own people with their own reasons for playing the game. Sao Feng helps in the operation to rescue Jack because he thinks it will get him closer to Beckett and ensure his own survival. He's playing in the team, but he's playing for himself. Jack elects Lizzie as the Pirate King because he thinks that going to war is his best shot at getting to Davy Jones's heart. He's playing in the team, but he's playing for himself. Davy Jones follows orders for most of the movie to protect himself, but when he's going to war at the end, he's doing it to annihilate the people who broke an agreement and released his biggest source of love and hatred. He's playing in the team, but... Well, clearly he's not really playing in the team anymore. <laughs> to be clear, I'm not saying that every character must always be out for themselves. I think that's more of a pirate thing. But I am saying that every main character must be out for their own reasons, on their own motivations. That's what will make the audience see them as people. That's the difference between Tony and Rhodey in Civil War. One of them is a person and the other is just kind of there on the team. Rhodey works just fine for a smaller role, sure, but what I mean is that he will never be Tony. <laughs> And until you fill your characters in a team with shades of individualism, they're always gonna be second raiders just there on a team. You know, Beckett, for example, shouldn't be a great villain because he seems to be a power-hungry commander acting on behalf of the crown, which these characters always do. But the reason I've always found him very fascinating is because that's not really who he is. He doesn't care about the crown. He's not looking for wealth and power because he already has those. Most of all, what he is is a guy from outside this pirate world who just doesn't get it. He's like an atheist in a church. All he sees is a bunch of dumb crap that he wants to bulldoze over so that he can get to the matters that actually matter. Oh, a legendary sea monster from the Bible, you say? I don't care. Toss it in the trash. This is no longer your world, Jones. The immaterial has become immaterial. And because I, a member of the audience, see Beckett that way, for me, he seems like a person, not another bad guy cog in another bad Hollywood blockbuster. That's how you should see your characters that you're creating for your ensemble movie, as a group of individual people, not as cogs in a mechanism. Just another reason why At World's End, despite its flaws, is still better than most. And with that being said, so ends the year 2023. Thank you everyone who followed the channel this year, and I will see you all again in February after some other work. That's a long time, I know, but luckily there's a way for you to get there faster. A life hack that's gonna put you to sleep like if Shawn Michaels showed up to switch in music you. Except, not so violent. It's this hot drink powder called Dream, a healthy blend of hot cocoa, for example, formulated to help you get the best night's sleep possible. Sounds like a good New Year's resolution to me. Listen, if you struggle falling asleep, staying asleep, if you wake up tired in the morning, this is designed to help. The powder contains these big brain ingredients like melatonin, sampled just the right way to ease your body and mind for sleep. There's a bunch of flavors to choose from, and they sent me the hot cocoa one to try out. I usually have trouble falling asleep because my head is always trying to pre-do next day's writing work, which leaves me tired in the morning. And this did help. It clears my mind, gets me asleep faster, saves me time and energy for the morning. Plus, there's been a study where 93% of participants said that Dream helped them get better sleep. Right now, Dream is sponsoring up to a 50% off New Year sale to let everyone try it out for themselves, so if this is something you could benefit from, check it out with my link below or by scanning the QR code on screen. Bye bye.